Hello everyone, thanks for your uh, patience while we sorted out uh, the small technical glitch. Um, thanks for being interested in the first place in this tutorial. Um, we'll be talking about uh, uh, ESA relations, how they uh, are available and represented in existing knowledge repositories, uh, if, if at all. Uh, how they are extracted automatically from uh, text and then we'll talk a bit about how they are used in uh, information retrieval. I have been, um, <clears throat> I've been working on uh, open domain information extraction um, for a few years now. Um, this is one particular subtopic uh, that I care about in that uh, larger field which is extracting ESA relations from uh, text. Uh, I'm with Google, I'm in Mountain View in California. Um, we'll be going over terminology very quickly. It's gonna be uh, lightning speed uh, because I don't think there is uh, much room for confusion. And if there is any, I'll be trying to avoid it just through these uh, two slides or so. Um, we're talking about concepts, um, <coughs> classes, instances, in the, and is relations uh, among them. Uh, a concept, as far as we can tell, is just a placeholder for a set of instances that share uh, similar properties. It's because of the presence of these sets of instances that concepts would probably end up being created in language and they, they end up getting this, what we refer to as class labels, these phrases that are supposed to describe the concept. Um, the example here is a set of movies, individual movies, and probably because they happen to be interesting to enough people over time, then probably in language there is, um, people will come up with some labels for these concepts, which could be one or multiple in case uh, synonymous phrase can be used to, to refer to the same uh, concept. Uh, and these relations are just pairs among um, such concepts or among an instance of the concept, um, where the more specific class is linked to the is a relation to the more general class. Uh, and there are various ways that people refer to, to, to this in literature, to these relations. Um, they refer to them as generalizations or specializations, uh, one concept to generalize or specialize the other. Or uh, the, the more specific concept would be a hyponym of the more general one or vice versa, the more general one is a hypernym. Um, or subsumption. Um, the more specific one is subsumed by the more general one and, and uh, vice versa. Um, but one of the important properties of this is a relation, so subsumption, is that the more specific class will inherit most of the properties, if not all the properties of the more general class, and then it will add some new properties, thereby specializing the more general class. Um, and the ESA relations can be either organized as a flat set uh, that, are, that are relations that are not connected to one another or they can be organized into an hierarchy. Uh, so the entire world could be ideally organized into this giant, uh, accurate, fine-grained uh, hierarchy of concepts that would describe any kind of instances or sets of instances in the world such that instances at the bottom of the hierarchy would be connected to more specific classes and then iteratively to more general classes all the way to the top. Um, as an example, Pulp Fiction, an instance of a movie could be connected to something relatively more specific like American fiction movie or American crime movie and then that would be connected to crime movie and then movie and so on, or going up uh, into the hierarchy. Um, also to avoid confusion, uh, I mentioned instance and uh, I know that in literature people use different uh, terms for this, but that's not a reason to be worried or to, to be confused. Uh, we'll be just referring interchangeably to concepts versus classes. They're gonna be the same for us. Uh, instance versus entities, uh, they're gonna be the same for us. And hierarchy versus taxonomy. This would be again the same for our purpose. Um, so first, we'll be looking at um, resources of knowledge that exist um, that contain ESA relations. And we'll see how these ESA relations are represented in such resources. 
Um, then we'll be looking, as I said, there's methods for, the, uh, for acquiring uh, easy relations from text, independently from existing resources, or maybe based on existing resources, trying to reach them or something like that. Uh, and then finally, like I said, we'll be touching on how these uh, easy relations, whether available in existing resources or extracted from text, uh, can be used in um, information retrieval. <coughs> As far as um, resources of um, easy relations go, uh, one could think of them as being categorized into two types. One is expert resources created by experts, that means a small set of people who have high expertise in that field. Um, that means probably you'd expect very high accuracy and reliability and um, interesting phenomena, phenomena being kind of properly taken care of in those resources. But then the downside would be that it's a small set of experts with high expertise, it's small set, so very hard to scale such resources, to scale them up, to extend them, to grow them, because it's just a few people who are basically the bottleneck um, in expanding such resources. And then on the other side, you have the non-expert resources, which tend to be collaborative. Um, where many people who are not necessarily experts at all in uh, knowledge acquisition or knowledge presentation or anything would contribute to these resources uh, more easily expanding them over time. Uh, in theory, of course, such resources could suffer from various problems because these people are not experts, so they, they may not realize uh, deeper phenomena that should be taken care of but are just glanced over and may affect the resource over time. Um, among expert resources, WordNet is probably the first that um, comes to mind uh, because it really, WordNet really is a taxonomy of the upper level of um, English concepts. These are relatively more general concepts in English. Um, we're not going to discuss WordNet in depth. I assume that everyone here in this room knows about WordNet. Uh, if that's not the case, let me know, but I assume that everyone knows. Um, uh, the key point for WordNet is that it was created by experts and they stay that way. Um, and what it does, uh, mainly the key kind of information in WordNet is this organization of English phrases into synonym sets or syn sets in their terminology, uh, where multiple phrases having the same meaning will belong to the same syn set and then the syn set being organized hierarchically. What we see here is sort of the upside down uh, hierarchy in WordNet. Um, we have a syn set, a group of phrases with the same meaning. Uh, we have syn sets, uh, so uh, these sets, we have, we have uh, definitions associated with them. All of this created by hand and then again created by hand is this hierarchy, conceptual hierarchy going, in this case going down, it's just upside down. Um, all the way to entity, which is I think the top node to which everything eventually floats up in the world. Um, Warnet does distinguish between concepts and um, instances. Uh, we mentioned that. that. There is a special relation in Warnet uh, that's called has instance, uh, for instance, uh, is the opposite. Um, but this is only partially useful because Warnet, um, probably everyone knows, uh, is not supposed to be an encyclopedia. When there are instances in Warnet, they are there for illustration purposes as opposed to they are never meant to be an exhaustive enumeration of the instances belonging to that particular concept. And you do not go to WordNet expecting that for any concept that you look up, you'll find anything like exhaustive sets of instances. For most concepts, there are no instances at all in WordNet. For some of them, there are the presidents of the United States. You find most of them under the president of the United States. Uh, and there are a few more concepts like that. But otherwise, if you look at painter and if you go down, you see a few painters maybe given as illustration, but certainly not, not all of them. Um, so no expectation of instance in WordNet, that's one key. And then the second key uh, limitation, what could say, um, is that um, one could argue that WordNet is not deep enough. Um, a, a concept like company may exist, but the concept like European company may not. A concept like company may exist, financial company may exist, but an American financial company may not. Uh, so there is a clear limit uh, as to how deep uh, Warnet goes across all the possible branches in the hierarchy. 
um, psyche is a very different um, beast of a resource. Um, it was created <coughs> back in the 90s, um, starting from sort of a counter um, argument to the trend at the time uh, and hope that natural language will hopefully uh, solve a lot of problems uh, with respect to knowledge acquisition. Uh, they were, took the pessimistic approach and they thought, no, um, knowledge acquisition will not solve this. There is a lot of knowledge that even with the best possible methods in 245 years from now, will not be possible to extract from text. Uh, one, because methods cannot advance uh, that much, and two, because a lot of this knowledge, basic knowledge, common sense knowledge that people uh, might have in their minds, in their hands, may never be expressed verbatim in text ever. Uh, why? Because this knowledge is sort of just so common sense, so basic, that it would be almost um, upsetting to someone else to describe it verbally. Um, to express the fact that if you start, uh, if you, um, that a match, uh, if you turn a, a match on fire, you'll have fire and then you can burn something with it. This is something that's common sense. It's very rare that you'll have this sort of knowledge expressed in text. Or the fact that if you have a ball and you let it off your hand, it's gonna fall. Uh, again, common sense knowledge may never appear in text explicitly. And so they took the time to um, create this knowledge repository by hand, uh, a lot, a lot of human effort put into it. Um, this is an example of an entry in psych. Um, everything in psych is an instance of something, but uh, so instance here has a bit of, has a different meaning than our sense of an instance, because everything is an instance, it's just uh, by default. Um, and Warner does associate concepts with uh, definitions. Um, psych associates concepts with definitions as well. Um, and the constants are organized into an hierarchy. So this is another resource of an hierarchy, uh, psych. Um, again, um, like Warner, uh, there is a distinction between concepts and instances. And this is done by rep representing uh, them through, by representing either relations through different two very different predicates. So you can tell exactly by looking at the predicate, you can tell which is which. Um, Sears Tower would be an easy skyscraper on the bottom left. Uh, Sears Tower would be a skyscraper, it's, it's a sub-concept, whereas um, uh, it's, um, it's an instance, whereas lower down skyscraper is an office building, is a generalization, so it's a sub-concept. So at the very bottom, you have concept to concept, just a bit higher, see a, sky, a tower to skyscraper, that's an instance of a relation. Um, again, scalability is an issue uh, because it's an expert created resource. Um, again, you cannot really expect to have uh, a lot of the more popular entities, whether movies, people, um, cities, and so on, or books have to be represented in there. On the other side, of this barrier between experts and non-experts, you have Wikipedia probably as the main um, representative resource. Um, it's the very famous encyclopedia that was created and is still created by, ex by um, collaborators on, on the web. Uh, and to jump straight to what we care about, we're not going to be talking about Wikipedia in general, um, but we care about Wikipedia with respect to is relations, are there is relations in Wikipedia? Uh, yes, there are quite a few, but they are hidden. Um, and specifically, Wikipedia organizes articles into categories. That's where a lot of the user relations are. At the bottom, what you see there is the, an article at the top and then the bottom of it. Uh, and you see at the bottom these categories, which many of us probably know about them, but maybe some of us do not pay attention to them. This is what you see at the bottom of most Wikipedia articles, if not all of them, these categories. Um, some of these categories represent is a relation, so hypernyms for the respective article, um, but then some of them don't. And there lies the conundrum with uh, Wikipedia. It's uh, very tempting. Uh, it contains a lot of is a relations, but then those is a relations are not marked explicitly. At least when it comes to relations between an article and its category, 
Wikipedia is not going to tell you which of those relations are is a relations and which of those relations are just topical relations. Um, it's really tempting, these categories, they are really tempting because the categories themselves have categories. Um, this is a um, Wikipedia category page for Arsenal FC seasons, and at the bottom it has other categories itself. Um, and again, some of these categories may be um, hypernames of the existing category, and some of them are not. So we see have either relations or not here. Very, very rich resource, Wikipedia of visa relations, because these categories are quite fine-grained. There are hundreds of thousands of them that I think are useful. I don't think Ronald really knows for sure how many are useful um, as, as categories, I mean, as hypernames, but probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, there are millions of them strictly, but many of them are really correspond to instances. Um, there are categories like uh, Melbourne. Melbourne could be a category. Uh, Google, I think, is a category. Uh, France, Paris are categories. Um, but those, of course, can never be hypernames. They can never be generalizations of any concept. They can only be hypernames or instances. So if you take those away, then you would probably still end up with hundreds of thousands of potentially useful categories. The problem is how you can tell which ones are categories versus uh, which ones are concepts through concepts as opposed to instances like Google. And the second problem is how you can tell which of these relations between an article and a category, or a category and a parent category, which of them are easy relations and which of them are not. These are not just philosophical questions. There is a big thread of work, and we're looking at, at it, a uh, big thread of work going over time, looking specifically at this task, taking Wikipedia in with the Wikipedia category network, as it's called, uh, like here, and trying to derive an hierarchy out of it. Um, again, here the, 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 era, the category network is upside down. So as you go down, you actually generalize. You go from an article at the top, you go to its categories, then to their parent categories and parent categories and so forth. And it's very, very easy to tell, as you can see, that a lot of these edges are not easy. Some of them are quite nice, if you could tell which ones they are, but a lot of them are not. Uh, at the bottom, for example, we have English football club seasons going down into sports on the left, and that's not an easy relation. But then going to the two seasons, that is a, is a, uh, an easy relation. So you'd have to tell uh, which ones are easy relations and which ones are not. And people, yeah, very tempting, so people jump into this task and they've been swimming in it for a while now. Including, this is an exit, this is, this is a thread of work that started in 2007, I think. And it's still current. There's going to be a paper at um, CITM uh, from someone in Zurich who cares about this topic and it's still improving the task of taking Wikipedia and producing hierarchies out of this category to category edges or article to article edges. Um, and then Wikipedia being so <coughs> easy to scale and just growing over time, uh, apparently effortlessly, um, various efforts try to take Wikipedia, take the unstructured text, mostly unstructured text or semi-structured text available on Wikipedia, and try to convert it into structured data or triples of some kind. Um, DBpedia is an example of such an effort. Freebase is another. Um, roughly, the goal of both of these resources and a few others um, is again to somehow take content on Wikipedia most of which is just unstructured, the actual text of the article, and some of which is structured, for example, the info box, that little box on the um, top right that many articles have, for example, for a person, it might give the birth date and the place of birth and maybe the net worth and spouse, if any, and children, if any, and so on. Um, that would be semi-structured information already. So take all this information somehow and then convert it, as I said, into triples, because triples, Relations, that's something that machines can then understand and process and do something with them, of course. <clears throat> in the case of Freebase, uh, specifically, um, do we find these relations in it? Yes, we do. We find these relations in two forms, in fact. Well, we used to because Freebase has been retired in the meantime. Um, 
one form is uh, types. And you see examples of types here for Willis Tower, which used to be Sears Tower is the same thing, just a different name for the same thing. And for natural language processing. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is one source and other sources collections, three based collections, which are basically sets of, again, instances that are supposed, supposed to share the same properties and they are given organized into collections. It, it's a detail, it doesn't quite uh, matter that much. Uh, one problem with three base, with three base types, is that quite a few of them are not, have an unclear utility in practice. Uh, and I remember how we would read these papers, uh, they would be recent, Freebase was still available, so people tried to use Freebase for experiments either to train some model out of it or to expand it or to do something with it, of various sorts. And then they would try to use Freebase types for experiments. And um, more than once you would see the authors uh, having to explain how it was difficult to use the types as they were, and so they had to somehow select some of them that made more sense and so forth. Um, part of the problem with the types is that there is no um, um, inherent concept of um, um, notability or utility. Uh, for example, this is not an, an actual example, I'm not ex uh, I don't remember exactly what the example is, but someone like Barack Obama could be listed among violinists, I think. I don't remember this, it's some sort of a player, you know, some, some sort of a player, some instrument. Um, and this could be at least confusing because there are people who do this professionally and then there is Barack Obama who plays an instrument maybe. And not being able to distinguish between these two could lead, you to, could lead to big problems when you do experiments and when you compute decision and recall, right? You don't necessarily want to extract Barack Obama as an instance of, say, violinists uh, in any system, right? Although he may be playing violin on, for, on his own. Um, some other resources derived from um, Wikipedia are Open Mind and then um, coming to the modern times, uh, Wikidata. Wikidata is the latest, um, is the new kid on the block, <laughs> relatively new. Um, <clears throat> again, the goal is to somehow produce lots of triples um, out of Wikipedia data or maybe some other data. Um, the, basic, um, the basic building blocks are, as I said, triples, they are property value pairs associated to various items. In, the, in Wikidata. Uh, and it's still growing, it's incomplete. If you go and look up various uh, topics of your, um, of your choice, um, you'll notice that for many of them, you, you scan the whole entry for in Wikidata and you'll see that quite a few properties that you think are useful are maybe missing from Wikidata, but it is growing. Um, data? yes, there is ESA data and Wikidata. Uh, Again, it's actually differentiated in instance to class relations uh, on the right side. Uh, that is the article for the Willis Tower, so Sears Tower. And then on the left, um, you see an example of class to class relations, which are called subclass of in uh, Wikidata. But there are relatively few, and not relatively, there are really few of such, a few such relations, at least for now Wikidata. Any questions? Um, and just to mention the obvious, um, people in the research community, uh, of course, they thought of these resources and identified straight and weaknesses for, for them. Uh, and then some of them, besides criticizing, <laughs> which is easy to do, uh, they decided to try to take advantage of the various strengths that, uh, complementary strengths that the resources may have. Um, and that's how example, um, how example uh, for example, Iago was uh, created. Uh, initially, at least, as an attempt to merge WordNet and um, Wikipedia into some bigger resource. But that was initially, but then it grew since then, and it contains some other um, data sources, just like Freebase does, and just like Knowledge Graph the internal version that's not available to the outside world of uh, Freebase, just as it does to 
contains knowledge from various sources besides Wikipedia, although Wikipedia remains the core. And it remains very important because that's where most of the concepts that are popular to many people are. Um, if there are no questions, then we'll be switching to the second part, which is how um, <clears throat> people have thought about um, extracting such as relations from text, as opposed to trying to look them up in some resources. Um, the idea is appealing, given the, that the web has been growing, uh, given that there is a lot of text in principle available on the web that could be in principle mined. Uh, there is text of the unstructured kind, just running text, expository text in documents. Uh, then there is semi-structured text available in um, lists um, or tables. And so all of these could potentially contain relations of many kinds that would be useful for other systems later on, including user relations, of course. And so people went for it. And what they went for specifically is for three kinds of um, knowledge, one could say. Either for instances within unlabeled concepts, where you just have a flat set of instances that are supposed to belong to the same concept or class without, without knowing what the class or the concept is. Uh, then the next level up, you could say, is to extract instances within labeled concepts. So not only extract um, Melbourne and Sydney and Perth, together in a set, um, but then also put some labels for them, something like maybe cities or Australian cities or something like that. And then, I don't know if the next level up, but something that logically would go on top of that would be to organize all this into uh, hierarchies. So rather than have um, independent sets, Australian cities, um, and um, Italian sports cars and so on, try to take all of these uh, sets or maybe label sets and organize them into some hierarchy that would ideally cover the whole, the universe of all concepts in the world that we'd care about. Um, the most basic step would be something like this, it would be extracting um, instances within unlabeled concepts. The purpose of these methods would be to somehow cluster, you could say, uh, objects in the, not objects, instances, let's not confuse ourselves, instances in the world so that they belong to the proper bins. So that they belong to bins where other instances of the same kind also belong. Of the same kind means other instances sharing the same properties. Uh, and they do if you look here. There are diseases on the left and then on the, on the right at the bottom there are countries. Um, all these are instances that are supposed to share common properties. Um, um, there is a bunch, of, a bunch of literature, of course. I just, I list some of the articles here, but then we look at a few of them. Um, uh, we'll be starting with um, work that was done at the University of Washington um, in 2008. And we'll take in this because it's representative for the uh, idea of set expansion. This was, uh, Again, and some chain of work that was popular for a while. Oh, yes, CME, CME, you're right, yes. William Cohen, of course, yes, CME. CME. Um, this is representative for um, um, work that was popular for a while in the context of lexicon expansion, um, set expansion, and then later on even relation expansion. Um, a lot of the relation expansion work was done uh, at ISI. Yeah. If you are to uh, risk again to name uh, uh, names of universities, um, some of this work was done at, um, in Los Angeles at ISI by Patti Pantel. He was a good representative of this kind of work and we'll be seeing one of the papers by him and some other authors later on. Uh, but here, as the title suggests, um, the goal is to take some target class that's available as a set of instances and then to expand it somehow so that you produce a longer rank list of instances of the same kind. So this is that expansion. Um, I get a few TV shows as input, as examples, 
and then I have to produce a longer ranked list of such TV shows so that the, the list is as large and as accurate as possible, of course. Uh, the data source in this case is text on the web. Um, and as steps, what happens here is that the search engine is used as a black box in the sense that some queries are um, constructed and issued automatically to the search engine. The top end results are fetched for, from the search engine and then process locally in order to extract some other instances that are supposed to be like the CV instances, that are supposed to be the correct set of um, uh, output instances. Um, Google was used in, the, in this case. Um, and the, um, what you see on the left is the input, like I said, a few instances. And in this case, they are um, examples of camera, of camera makers. And on the right, you see a larger uh, rank list that is supposed to be the uh, output of this. Um, and we can go straight to an example. Um, this is an example from the author, from Richard Wang. Um, um, this is uh, the HTML text for a particular web document. Um, and in this case, um, maybe I should go a bit in, not in more detail, but give you an overview about of, of how the, the method actually works. Um, you start with a um, small set of seed sets that is given as input. And what, what they do is they would, they would iteratively take um, two or more of these um, seed instances um, and use them as evidence uh, for the purpose of extracting more instances that may be like them from the web. And the intuition here is that because of regularity, because you expect regularity in web documents, some HTML regularity, then um, the same seed instances may appear in some patterns, you can call them some HTML patterns, uh, and if they do, the other elements that follow the same pattern in the same web page um, may belong to the same class. This is the intuition. And so if you, if you are given a, a set, again, um, an input set of seed instances, um, then if you take a few of them, and in random, they don't actually do random combinations, but they take a few smaller sets, some smaller possible sets, by analyzing the content of the top web documents we take from, uh, from the web, from the search engine, it is in principle possible to find candidate instances that are like this. And like this, again, means they appear in the same HTML patterns, or wrappers, as they call them, with some of the seed instances. Um, and if Ford and Nissan are uh, seed instances in this example, um, then if you were to look in, look, just look, their mention, look up their mentions in this document, you find them here in particular. These are two occurrences. Um, and as you can see in the highlighted regions, everything is the same except for the seed instances. So that means that the remaining of the highlighted areas can be thought of as some potential rules or wrappers as they call them again. Um, and if there are any, uh, such other occurrences of the same rule or wrapper, then the varying portion, the variable portion may represent candidate instances that belong to the same class, to the same hidden class. In this case, Honda and Acura appear on the same web page in the same pattern. Um, and then finding two other occurrences of Ford and Nissan on the same page, will give you some other candidates. In this case, Honda, again. And then finding them elsewhere will give you some other candidates. Um, so depending on what kind of, um, how lucky you are on how um, relevant the top documents written by the search engine are, even within the same page, one can extract, identify and extract multiple candidate instances. Um, and this is done just with two starting from two of the seed instances. But if the seed instances are available in a higher number, then the process can be repeated for other combinations or subsets of the seed instances so that more candidates are extracted. Um, switching to Pakti Pantel that I mentioned earlier, um, like I said, his, um, 
representative researcher for um, uh, work on lexical and relation expansion. Um, what we're looking at here is not that work specifically, but it's something else uh, that sort of builds on what we've seen before, um, which is how can you handle sort of seamlessly evidence coming from different sources and maybe for, from different methods. Evidence towards the fact that some relation that you are interested in may indeed appear in some places. Um, and then this is applied, the experiment is relevant to us because it's, um, the goal is again to expand um, instances. Um, in this case, we have a bunch of actors uh, as input. Um, then for the same classes of interest at input, um, you may have available some relations uh, for those uh, classes. And this could be happening because, for example, you have access to say something like Freebase, for example, at the time, or some structured uh, repository, or the info boxes in Wikipedia, say. And based on the info boxes in Wikipedia, you may uh, have access to relations such as Leonardo DiCaprio and Inception, some movie, so probably acted in that particular movie. Or the fact that Nicole Kidman acted in some other movie. Um, and this may be represented again in something like Wikipedia info boxes, or it may be more explicit. We can say that in uh, something like Freebase or the Knowledge Graph. Um, and then the goal, given a variety of data sources that might contain different kinds of evidence, um, the goal again is to extract a rank list of, of instances, um, one per target class. In this case, extract more actors. Um, but the, resource, uh, the sources are quite different. So you have web documents, you have web queries. Uh, within web documents, you have not just unstructured text, but you have semi-structured text in the form of tables. And then you have Wikipedia articles, which again is text, but it's supposedly, you know, it's a bit, it may be thought of as a bit different than just random web texts of arbitrary quality. Um, and then the architecture that they use is this, but um, this is very easy to explain. Um, uh, the, um, what we have on the left is the um, sources, and um, this is a general, a general um, architecture that they propose. But in their case, the sources are what I was saying before, documents, queries, tables from documents, and so forth. And that's what you have on the left. Uh, then you have what they call knowledge extractors, which is really nothing more than various methods that would try to go after the relation of interest somehow. Um, for example, if you have easy relations, you could try to um, look for some patterns in English documents that might express easy relations. Something like um, companies such as something, or companies including something. Uh, patterns that um, were introduced in 1992, I think, by Marty Hurst, and then people kept on using uh, them since then. Um, on the top, uh, those feature generators, um, what those really are, are how this evidence that, the, um, that some particular pair or entity or instance is relevant to the task at hand, the evidence how that may appear in, uh, in practice in text. This could be, I don't know, counts, uh, the co-occurrence of some possible instance and some possible class or something like that. Um, the ranker itself, this is what's supposed to one, build a model, which really means take all this evidence available um, from all these multiple sources coming from the left, create the model, and then apply the model so that you can actually extract new candidate instances and rank them and then issue them as output. Um, this is just a summary of what I said. Um, just a look at the uh, features um, because I thought this was a bit, um, it's a bit of detail but, uh, but then it's still interesting I think. Um, how do you go about 
possibly finding evidence that something may or may not belong to the class that you care about. Um, well, given these multiple sources that you have on the left, this family under the family column, web query, uh, web tables in Wikipedia, um, the, um, the features are often organized as you can see in, um, into frequency, distributional or terminus types. Uh, for frequency, for example, you can have like term frequency, document frequency, term frequency as noun phrase. Um, for something like pattern, this could be a pattern as I was suggested before, uh, what people often call, what, what we think of as Hearst patterns because it was Marty Hearst that introduced them uh, back in 1992. Uh, X such as Y and X including I and, and, and so forth. This uh, sort of obvious or uh, highly indicative uh, expressions in English text of uh, pairs of phrases that may be an easy relation uh, if they appear in a sentence in, in, the, in that form. Um, and then you have distributional terms and so forth. Uh, the terminus one, I wanted to point this out. Um, for terminus, this is just an estimate of how likely it is that this particular kind of engram or piece of text may actually be an instance of a concept as opposed to just a random engram. Um, and um, I think we'll see this a bit later as well. Um, this is something that may, we may not think of, uh, like in theory this is not something that you care about, but in practice it is. Uh, because, it, because in practice as you process unstructured text of document sentences, if you use a parser or a chunk or non-phrase chunk or whatever it is, it may make errors. Uh, so you may not know exactly where the phrase starts and where it ends, you only have guesses, is that the correct one or not. Um, and that's perfect if it's text in the document, but if it's queries, what do you do? In a query, how can you really guess reasonably well where a true phrase starts and ends in a query? In a web search query that in principle could be just like a random set of mixed up keywords, right? It could be a properly well-formed sentence. It could be a proper well-formed question, like what is the capital of Australia? But it could also be just a set of keywords. It could be Australia capital or capital Australia. You don't know what the person really meant when they submitted that particular set of, set of keywords or maybe full sentence or full phrase. Uh, so the terminus, this idea of terminus there, uh, that it matters even more. Um, anyway. What they do is that they collect um, evidence from multiple sources, they combine all of it seamlessly. Um, and this was a step forward at the time because we were not quite sure how multiple evidence, again, coming from different sources could be combined in a way that would not, that would not require a lot of fine tuning, in a way that would not uh, make one source dominate others uh, and so forth. Um, also, Patrick Pantel was involved in this um, other work. Um, this is with Alpa Jain. They were at uh, Yahoo Research at the time. Um, and they looked at queries specifically. This is a neat idea. Um, as data sources, you'd only have anonymized web search queries available, so just sets of uh, queries that are independent from one another, or maybe they are not independent, so maybe they come in sessions. And in this case, they actually have uh, clicks, click-through rates, uh, click uh, data associated with the queries. And then also have web documents, and what they were curious about is how it, uh, this whole thing started. What they were curious about was um, if you were to look at context in which one particular phrase or instance appears. Um, how do these contexts look like when you look in queries versus documents? For a given instance, do they look similar, the, all these contexts, or not? Um, the, the output for what they do is a cluster of similar instances. Um, and the key insight here is that the contextual space of web documents versus the contextual space of uh, web search queries may in fact be expected to be different. Um, 
intuitive, like behind the scenes, the reason for this would be the documents are, can be thought of as a way for people to express knowledge as supposed to be consumed by other people. So in a way, this knowledge is supposed to represent more objectively, one could say, uh, what people think about the world. Whereas in queries, their idea was that queries are more likely to be subjective expressions of knowledge or requests for knowledge. And um, one um, simple illustration for this, for uh, Britney Spears, for example, um, was that if you were to look at web documents, at all the co uh, contexts in which um, Britney Spears appears, and then you collect the context for Britney Spears, and then you collect context for other possible instances from web documents, and then you um, create vectors of context for each instance, each candidate instance, and then you compute the similarity among these, all these vectors. Then what you find is that on the web, um, the vectors most similar to the vector of Britney Spears are the ones for things like Bruce Springsteen and Celine Dion, which intuitively, these are sort of siblings, right? This, this overall, this left circle here um, represents kind of a class of maybe singers or something like that. We don't know the class table, but this seems to be a, quiz, a set of instances that do share the same properties and probably belong to the same class. Whereas on the right, we have things like Serena Williams, Paris Hilton, along with Britney Spears. And again, this would be the instances whose vectors of occurrences would be the most similar to the vector of Britney Spears. But in this case, the vectors would be collected from queries. So you would find, you'd intuitively find all the queries where Britney Spears is mentioned, and then you take the remainder of the query, and each of those remainders becomes one entry in a big vector. And if you have to compare the vectors, you find that for the experience, it's Serena Williams and Paris Hilton that are the most similar. Um, if you were to think of this a class, these are kind of celebrities, right? Um, and the, um, the same thing happens for something like Galapagos Islands. On the left, you have, uh, on, from the web, you have other regions that are the most similar to it. And on the right, you have other sort of topics related to travel to islands that are the most similar. Um, this has to do with how queries are issued, if you think of it. This, there is no secret, there is no oddity, let's say, in this. Maybe it's a bit surprising, but it all comes from queries. In the case of Britney Spears, for example, uh, you know, in documents, if you were to find all the mentions of Britney Spears, it would be centers, it would just mention her, so British peers sang and British here received the award and what, what not, right? And this would happen maybe in other documents for Celine Dion and Bruce Springsteen. So the context would kind of be similar in, in aggregate for these singers. But then in queries, when British Spears is mentioned in queries, she might be mentioned in a query like uh, Britney Spears uh, net worth or how rich is Britney Spears, or you know, how famous, or what, what's her age, Britney Spears' age, age Britney Spears. I'm just making up these queries. But you can see how in queries, it is possible that if you look at all these queries where Britney Spears appear, they may look like queries looking for sort of celebrities as opposed to, for, as opposed to singers. Just, just what comes out of how people collectively search for on the web. And so the clusters, of these instances that he obtained from the web versus queries can look quite different. And this is important because if you expected something like classes, then you should probably go for the web. And if you expect something like related topics somehow, you should probably go for the queries, as you can see. Um, um, I, so I mentioned terminus earlier for the other paper. Uh, this comes up again here, and this is just a very nice, sort of obvious, clear way to approximate whether a phrase may actually be a instance or not. Because again, these are queries, right? How do you know that some n-gram, some portion of a query is an instance or not? Uh, this is a very, very nice intuition that I really liked it a lot. It's just an assumption that actually works well in practice. And the assumption or the observation or the intuition is that um, all the queries are supposed to be just, you know, these statements, um, searches typed in a rush 
uh, by various people. Sometimes what people do is that they run into some relatively new concept maybe. They may copy and paste that from some web document and then continue the query. And then if that's the case, then what they wanted, to, what they copied and pasted it in the first place is an instance, some book name, some actor that you never heard of, or maybe you want to know more about. Then since that was copied from a document, that would preserve case, which in English matters. In English, if you look at case, that's an approximation of what the proper names are, right? It's some approximation that's reasonable. And so by looking for case occurrences within queries, which is made, it's not something that is, that you think obvious, like, well, why do you find capitalization in queries? Well, for this reason, because sometimes people copy and paste. Um, if you look for capitalization, then these contiguous sentences of capitalized words, you could assume that these are maybe candidate instances. This thing together, everything that's capitalized and only what's capitalized may actually be a candidate instance and the rest may be something else in the query. Uh, so this is the main intuition that they, I, I really like this. Uh, it's just a neat uh, approximation. Um, of course, there will be a lot of noise, um, but then they take all these candidates from the web and then they rank them according to some criteria and then they require these candidates to also appear as full length queries as another sort of reasonable sanity check. Why? Because if something like Google is a reasonable in instance and it's reasonably popular or of interest to enough people, then there will be some people that will submit just Google as a query. People who maybe want to find information about Google who never heard of it. Same for Melbourne, same for some book that was maybe released last year that became popular, or maybe it's not popular, just heard about it from some friend. And then you might type just the name of that instance as a query. It's of course, there is no rule, no one is forced to do this, but it's something that if you think of it, it's you kind of expect it to happen. Some instances, any instance in the world, if it's important enough to enough people, you'd expect that instance to be typed as a whole full length query and nothing else. And of course, there'll be some other queries where the instance is contained and something else will be content as well. So this is another intuition that they used as another heuristic for how to identify these candidate instances. Again, this may seem like nothing, right? It's not like that interesting for research, but it's a, it's a practical need, right? It's a, especially from queries, you an anagram, a query, how do you know what is an instance? This is one approximation for how you can go about it. Um, um, as I said, the, um, how each instance is represented is through a vector of contexts. Um, this context could be in the case of documents, they are context of occurrence of that instances in various document <coughs> sentences. Each occurrence will have some words, basically a window of words on the left and right, and that becomes a context. Same thing in queries. In queries, you have the phrase accompanied possibly by something else on the left and right. And there is also the click-through data that I said that they had available for this experiment. And then you can create context out of the data too. In this case, it's not like, it's not like that this instance appeared in some context, but it's more like for this, inst for this query, you had a click towards this document. And that document in some sense, you can think of it as a context. So that particular document becomes one of these elements in, in the vector of that would represent this instance, uh, a candidate instance in that space, in the click-through data space. Um, and then in their experiments, the experiments were not about ESA relations specifically, but in the experiments, they were asking people to decide whether given an instance, you, you see I know, something like Britney Spears, and then you see this other phrase, do you think that if you are interested in the first one, it'd also be interested in the second one. So this is just relatedness. It's, this is much looser than is a relations, of course. Um, but I still wanted to show it because of this last table, uh, I mean, the, the, the bottom table, um, because they looked a bit at what kind of um, relations are encoded in these clusters coming from different sources, right? But in those columns, what you see is you see uh, CL web. That means um, 
um, that this is this is the web data. So unstructured text on the web, web documents. Uh, CL context, um, that's I think uh, queries. And then you have the click data, the third column, and then you have the hybrid, you have a mix of all. Um, but if you look at the first and second and third columns, you see how for the sibling row, uh, the highest number is for, for the web. Right? Sibling is what I was uh, telling you about earlier. Sibling is, these are probably coordinate terms that would all be hypernames of the same hidden uh, class. So for Britney Spears, this would probably be other actors. That would all be actors. You don't know if they are actors, but they are siblings of Britney Spears in the sense that they share some properties with her. Um, whereas in the case of the context and the click-through rate, um, you see how topical relations are much more prominent. And topical, this could be very, very useful actually in the case of web search to sort of expand or to rank behind the scenes without people knowing or without the users knowing what's going on. Uh, but getting to related topics could easily bring in some document that they other, otherwise may have missed and so forth. Uh, but if your goal is to extract um, either relations or uh, the water dart version here is to extract set of instances that all belong to the same hidden classes, like unlabeled classes, then um, queries or click data is not going to be your main preference for the task because they give you mostly related topics as opposed to siblings. Um, besides extracting um, sets of instances that belong to unlabeled concepts, the more interesting maybe uh, next step is to label such sets. So extract not only the instances, but also the label that goes with them. And that means that at this point, you actually extract either relations because any pair of, um, of one of these instances and the label above it, each of these pairs would actually be supposed to be an, uh, an either relation. Um, yellow fever uh, and diseases on the left, on the top left, that would be an example of an either relation that ideally would want to extract from the web. Uh, and of course, if you extract the data properly, then it should naturally get organized and um, organize itself into these boxes that are labeled. Uh, what I mean by that is if you extracted um, is relations without caring about these groups. If you did it properly, then extract a bunch of search engines, a bunch of Australian cities correctly. And it's simply the fact that if the relations are correct, then under Australian cities as a hypernym or more general concept, you should have multiple hyponyms or instances that should all be correct, which should belong to the same class or hyperneme. Um, the very top reference uh, is something that's still in use. Uh, these are the patterns that I was alluding to earlier, I think twice already. Um, Marty Hurst, professor at Berkeley, she still is there, I think. Um, she just had this observation, which seemed, no, it seems obvious now, but she was the first one to propose this set of patterns that we all refer to now as Hearst patterns uh, that would just be in the style X such as Y. So, I know of many companies such as ExxonMobil, Who, and so on, or um, painters such as Degas and, and, and so forth. Um, this, the presence of such patterns in English sentences is often indicative of uh, an easy relation between the two phrases on the two ends of the patterns. Um, and they're still in use now, even recently. It's not the only source of evidence, but it's one of them. Let's go through um, some of these examples. Um, this one, again, to risk, the, <laughs> to risk naming the university again, or the institution, this was uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, Parta Talukdar was a PhD student at the time. In the meantime, he finished and he's a professor in India now. Uh, I'd say quite uh, well accomplished already. Uh, he's doing very well. Um, in this work, um, what he was looking at was how do different types of graph-based algorithms perform at this task of extracting either relations. 
and two, um, what he also wanted to check is to what extent could semi-structured or structured knowledge that's available on the side maybe for free, for free, that's already available in something like Freebase, for example. Um, how, such, how could such knowledge serve as evidence that could improve what you do? And it should be useful, right? So what I mean by that is, if based on some methods, you're hoping that say Britney Spears and Celine Dion, <laughs> there is evidence that these two belong together and these two both have the class labels, say singers, let's say. If separately you have something like Freebase, like Wikipedia or Freebase, right? And there is evidence in those sources that um, for Celine Dion, for example, you have birth ear something. And then for British Spears, you have birth ear something. Just the presence of the same predicate, right? That's, it. That's the same property that they both of these instances have to satisfy. Different values, of course, but the same property. And then you, you move on, then maybe both of them have spouse. Maybe both of them have nationality, different values, but again, the same property be satisfied by both. This would serve as additional evidence that would kind of confirm at least that yes, yes, it's okay to at least guess that these instances belong to the same class. It makes sense, it makes more sense actually. The more properties you that they satisfy in common, the more likely they are to belong to the, to the class. This actually by, in my opinion, this is like by the very definition of what the class is, right? That's how we started the, the tutorial. That's what I was saying at the beginning, that um, a concept is really a set of instances that, that share the same properties. If someone can enumerate the properties for you, that you're, you're done, right? You're, it's a done job. If you can tell that these two instances have these 75 important properties in common, of course, different values. The same properties, yeah, you're done. They clearly belong to the same class. No, no questions asked. Um, the, um, without going into details, uh, these kind of algorithms, this kind of label propagation algorithms would start with, um, this is just a representation, um, graphical representation of something that would happen in real, in the real world. So that's what I wanted to show you. You know, set one, set two, this actually could mean something real, which is that the second set could be a set of um, two instances in, the, in this case on the right, you see the edges, the outgoing edges uh, towards the right. And this could be produced by uh, those Hearst patterns applied to web documents. Uh, you have two particular instances that appear in the same pattern set. And then the first set could be a different kind of source, could be that in the same table, in the same column, you had these multiple instances on the right appearing as cells. <coughs> And that's another evidence that the, it's evidence for what? The evidence that these three instances might belong to the same class. You don't really know. You don't know what they are, but they do appear in the same column. That's what this table says about the other table says, the other table says uh, some pattern that says uh, something such as Johnny Cash and Billy Joel and so forth. And you could represent this evidence, this um, how strong the evidence is uh, that these edges apply to some uh, numbers here. Um, there is an edge weight, and this could be anything. This could be, I don't know, the PMI uh, between, I don't know, the hypernym and the hypernym appearing something, or the co-occurrence count, or it could be anything like that, a normalized co-occurrence count. Um, but the, uh, in essence, it's a label propagation algorithm. In essence, you start from a seed label, something like musician in this case, and this is input data. So you are told that Billy Joel is a musician. And so you start that way. And what you want to find is predicted labels in the end. You start from seed labels and you want the predicted labels. So in, this, in um, iteration zero, um, you have the seed label on the, on the bottom right in iteration one, you have propagation, so it goes to the top left. You're now thinking maybe for set one, it's possible that musician actually is a label that applies with some, let's say probability or whatever that weight is. And then in the next iteration, this should be propagated to uh, Bob Dylan. And so at this point, you'd be thinking that, well, Bob Dylan, based on information that I have in this graph so far, 
uh, I'd be thinking that yes, this might be a musician with say probably lithium weight uh, 0 0.6. Um, it would be this sort of um, propagation that would happen on these graphs and it could get quite complicated. And like I said earlier, um, these graphs could also contain edges that correspond to semi-structured data coming in from some existing resource. Um, and they show that it's, it's just easy to blend the data in and increase uh, precision. If you, were, if you were to go, if you're curious, if you were to go to the paper, they have, of course, detailed evaluation and they show how the availability of this extra data from Tribes at the, at, in that case or from Yago, which is actually Wikipedia plus uh, one plus other resources, uh, how this data helps improving uh, precision and recall for the task. Um, this is what they found at the time. Um, the, um, is the yellow, the, the method that they propose here is the yellow um, bars, that's what they call MAD. Um, and they, they got quite a bit of improvement by combining evidence from multiple sources. Um, TextRunner plus Yago, um, at the very bottom um, in the table on the left. This represents evidence coming from text because TextRunner is an extraction system. This one was from the University of Washington. Um, it's a system that at the time was trying to extract ESA relations from text basically by start, starting from Hearst patterns initially. And then Iago is the source for the semi-structured data, kind of property value pairs. Um, and in combining the two, they obtained, uh, if you have to look in the paper, they got better um, results as, as hopeful as expected. Um, any questions? I'm not quite sure I, uh, I failed to look at the watch. I don't know what time it is, how far we are. Could get the phone. Um, this is people people thought about this and they um, the sort of obvious or simple way they they try to avoid this problem is that they would um, they would have conflicting data but that how should I say it? not conflicting data it is conflicting but there's no one in the in the input data that they have available they would be attempting to at the same time extract classes for say actors and uh, buildings and cities and watches and so forth and they would know that the watch is not a city and the city is not a building and, and so on. And so that means that the input would contain both positive evidence for a given class and negative evidence coming from all the other classes. And in fact, it's the same author, it's Parta, again, Parta Talogdar, who had another paper, I think, soon after. I, actually, I don't know if it was soon after or be, a bit before. And I, know, I actually I know the other author I happen to know, um, where they had exactly this observation, and that's how they um, went after it. By at the same time trying to solve multiple, not multiple tasks, but trying to fill in multiple classes at the same time, where the presence of the other other classes actually and trying to fill them in helps you filling in any of the individual classes because the others provide some negative evidence. 
not just implicitly but explicitly that is competing they are competing for the same thing it doesn't avoid like it doesn't guarantee it would avoid the problem but it's one way that people uh, tend to go uh, about it to avoid it Um, this this work is more recent. This comes from um, Stanford, uh, from Percy Liang uh, and one of his students. Um, it's quite uh, they set up the problem quite aggressively. Uh, in the sense that what uh, what they, you are given is the class table for which you want to extract some instances. <clears throat> in this case, we have something like Harkin trails near Baltimore. Um, and you want to extract this by using web documents. Um, and of course, in practice, this is time. So in practice, you will have a, a search engine as a black box, probably. You'll be able to issue queries to it, and then you'll be able to process the top end documents retrieved by the search engine to do something else that you want locally. Um, but the output is supposed to be a set of instances of this class. Um, uh, and what they do here is that again they exploit the HTML structure of the retrieved documents in order to extract or to form um, potential extraction predicates like this, like this one at the bottom. Um, and the way to read this is uh, to be read as a sort of a path. So what you see here is the DOM tree of the document. Um, and if you were to look at the path at the bottom, this will allow you to navigate the tree starting at the top. So it means that it's HTML. You start from HTML, and then the the super the um, uh, in square brackets, what you have is a number that is just a number uh, which which of the edges you have to follow in the tree going down. So it will tell exactly which at, at given any node which of its children you should you are supposed to follow. So it's just this is just a way to navigate. It gives you a map of how to reach a particular node from a particular starting point. Um, not all of these are um, have a script, as you can see towards the end, TR there, that doesn't have a script. So that means that you can follow them all. This is the difference. So whenever you reach the point, the, the TR, that means that from any TR, you should be able to, you should follow any TRs, not just the first one. Okay. Um, and then given some web page uh, that would be among the top end, retrieved by some search engines, uh, whatever the search engine is, uh, the goal is to somehow, of course, identify regularities in these web pages. Um, and then produce a bunch of extra uh, possible extraction paths, like the one before, like this one at the, top, at the bottom, where extraction predicates and somehow rank them uh, so that the best one flow to the top so that then you can you are able to extract uh, relevant instances for the given class. Um, and in terms of extraction features, um, this is the authors um, send me this for illustration, which I never thought this was um, useful. Um, think of this, the boxes at the, top, at the top, think of this as maybe Kind of lists on the web page, lists or regularity. More generally, this would be regularity in a web page, of course, right? And this may be all section headings of the same kind, or they could all belong to the same list, or they could be all part of the same table. Um, but the um, the question or the intuition is: Could these these multiple tables, each of them, could this be relevant to the task at hand? Uh, do they constitute reasonable sources of candidate instances that you want? Harkin trails near uh, Baltimore. Um, so they have multiple features that they compute, that they are very, very easy to compute. Um, if you look at something like identity, this means identity among the items in this list, in the box. Each, in each box, you check for identity among the items. Um, green means given this feature, this table, yes, this, this might be a good table. And red means, given this feature, this table is not a good table. Okay, so for identity, you want diversity. 
among the items. If they are all the same, like in the middle, if John Adams appeals multiple times in that structure, whatever it is, the same list or the same section titles, H2 something, uh, that's not a good sign because these are probably not, uh, not individual hiking trails. Um, for the table on the, for the, for the box on the right, according to this criterion, this might be okay because they are diverse, they are different. So, so far you cannot, just based on this simplistic feature, right, simple feature identity, it might be a reasonable one. Um, but then if you look at something like part of speech, um, parts of speech that would give you, for, the, for people who may not be familiar with this or much familiar, um, these are not just the parts of speech that are maybe assigned by some parts of speech targeted to individual words in, this, um, in these phrases. Um, and we are, all we see here is something like NNP, which should be a proper noun, or NN, which should be a common noun, or NNS, on the right, on the top right, which is just um, plural, uh, common noun. Um, this is just part of speech tags. It's not very, it's not important to know what they are. But again, the intuition here is that if you look for parts of speech within a table, you want them to look the same for the individual, for different items. It's just, uh, it's not perfect, right? It's not perfect because if you have, um, you know, George Washington is two words. Uh, and they are all, I guess, U.S. presidents in that box. But then there may be, but there may be U.S. president that um, is three words. Uh, you know, his sort of popular name somehow is three words, and that would not be identical according to this criteria. But in pr in principle, I then um, having the same sequence of part of speech tags seems like a good. Uh, seems like a clue that this is a good table. Whereas on the right side, having a very diverse. Uh, set of sequences of part of speech tags for these items is probably a bad sign. It's probably a table that you do not want to consider. Um, this is an example of some real path um, that their system produced. Uh, you can see that it can, it can actually go quite deep in the DOM tree. Um, but for something like Disney Channel movies, you'd be able to extract things like Northern Lights and Admiral Raps and so on. Um, well, and um, this is just one of the graphs from their evaluation. Um, as baseline, they uh, just looked at the most frequent uh, extraction patterns. The extraction patterns or predicates are those uh, paths, right? The, those sequences of uh, HTML tags. Um, and they have much better performance in accuracy relative to the baseline. Um, both when they consider the entire list of instances that they extract and also they get high precision, of course, if they look at the top five, only the top five instances that they extract, if they don't go all the way down to the entire list. Um, but 40% is quite nice to get, if you think of it, because they don't know in advance how many to extract. This is quite important if you think of it, right? Um, you are given hiking trails in Baltimore, but you're not told how many to try to extract. So you could easily go nuts and try to extract 70 million. And if you try to extract 70 million, most, most of the items that you extract will be wrong because there aren't that many hiking trails near Baltimore. Um, so getting 40% when you don't know how many to extract, so you have to go through all the items in your extracted list, that's not that all. Um, there is a detail on how they did evaluation here. Um, for practical reasons, they, in the evaluation, they look at them, <clears throat> how to explain this easily. Um, in each of these lists, in the rank list, they look at not at every item in the list, they don't check every item for correctness, but they check the first one, the second one, and the last one as an approximation for the entire list. Um, and they do this only because this way, um, they don't have to ask people separately uh, to annotate the correctness of the, right, of the test data. Uh, they don't have to uh, spend too many resources, too much money, and ask too many people for that. So instead of having, if you have a list of 25 items, 
uh, and you want to check the correctness, when do they, they do that with uh, you know, Amazon Turkers, I think they used at the time, uh, as human annotators. They didn't ask them each, each of these, uh, for each of the items in this list, is this a correct item for this uh, class, for something like hiking trails in Baltimore. Instead, they only asked them, is the first one correct, the second one correct, and the last one correct? So they only had to annotate three as opposed to 25, which saves a lot of time. This is the detail, but again, I, I just wanted to point out how details matter in practice, right? They could have easily gotten stuck on this task and uh, like the annotation could never end for like 20 months and they'd run out of their budget and sometimes in research and also in practice like in industry, these details could make a difference. Sometimes they make the difference between something happening or not because you don't have the time, you don't have the resources, or, or in practice, not like you don't, but you have limited everything. Um, a paper from two years ago would be trying to also extract these relations, but going specifically after tables, uh, web tables. Um, <clears throat> And what you have here as input is two uh, things. You, you have the class label, something like database software in this case, and you also have um, a set of seed instances like Oracle and MySQL and SQL Server and Teradata. Um, given a collection of tables from web documents, so this is semi-structured data, again, it's not document sentences. Again, the goal is to extract the rank list of instances of this target class, it's database software in this case. Um, and um, the way they do it is that they first retrieve some set of tables that are hopefully relevant for the task. And for this, they actually use a black box. Um, this research happened at Microsoft um, they had access to a table like off-the-shelf table search system that was already available at Microsoft um, and so they would be able to take the class label submit it as a query and somehow that black box would return a rank list of tables that hopefully were relevant whose content was hopefully relevant for this query and then the real work started from there. So given these tables, their goal was to, as I said, to somehow, of course, somehow find the seed instances in this table somehow, so that they can extract other instances that also belong to the same class from the tables. Um, and maybe because they were, you know, maybe be because they were in industrial research environment or something, um, they had, um, they had a good nose and they knew they had some experience before and they knew that um, this kind of problem requires uh, gentle steps as opposed to trampling, possibly trampling the whole thing in the sense that it's very, very easy to, um, the key problem here is how to identify out of those tables extracted by the black box for the query, how to select the relevant tables and only the relevant tables. That's in the end, this is the main goal in the paper. Of course, there are many other things that happen, but this is key. And it's key because if you extract the, um, if you select the wrong table, then it will be picking wrong candidates from the table. And it's, and it's very, very, very easy to just uh, go off, uh, just float into the, in the semantic space away from where you want to be, away from database software in this case. Um, and this is just a concrete example for what I'm saying. Um, so remember that, so we have Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, and Teradata as seed instances, and we also know it's database software that, um, that is the class that we care about. That black box system, table search system, could return um, to you tables like this. Um, and at the top you have what they call in the refer to in the paper as uh, exclusive tables. Uh, these are the ones that they care about. Exclusive would mean these exclusively, tables exclusively are supposed or hoped to contain only relevant instances in some column. Versus the non-exclusive tables at the bottom, 
which may contain in the same column some other instance that are not relevant to the query that you care about, to database software, uh, in this case again. And this can very easily happen, as you can see. These are like real tables. I mean, they give them as examples, but this can easily happen in practice, right? You can easily imagine, right, that the companies like Oracle and Terabata would be uh, treated as companies, as, as vendors of something in the bottom left table. And then there would be a table on the web somewhere that lists their revenue. But these vendors are not necessarily database uh, software vendors. So if you, if you selected this table and tried to pick uh, candidate instances from that column, you'd pick IBM and Microsoft, which would be wrong instances to pick for the class database software. Um, so a lot of the work that they do in the paper is somehow figure out which of the tables are they, what they call exclusive um and zero in on them and try to extract instances from them as opposed to from the others because otherwise again there would be very um semantic diff to happen instantly and then what you'd extract would be wrong i think um we can yeah we can finish just just a quick illustration um and then we I th i'm thinking to take a break maybe um what you see on the left here is um a set of instances, like candidate instances. Um, on the right are the tables that they come from. Uh, the green instances are the seed instances. You'll know these are true. Uh, these are correct for your class and somehow you want to extract more um, that are correct. Um, the algorithm proceeds gently. It looks at the edges connecting instance on the left and tables. Connecting means simply that the instance appeared in the table. That's all it means. Uh, and since the first table um, at the top contains more of the um, green instances on the left, uh, that's one that's considered as a potential candidate. Um, and then based on that, going back through all its edges, PostgreSQL becomes a candidate instance that might be another instance of the same class. Um, that PostgreSQL and MySQL belong to both to T2. So in the next step, T2, table T2 might be considered as the next one. Um, and depending on how tight your termination criteria are or, so, or how loose, you might actually stop there. Uh, be careful. Um, what I wanted to point out is that they uh, they are careful. So their method is careful in the sense that it only takes one, if I remember correctly, in each of these steps, it takes one table at a time and decides whether that's the one, one to keep or not and then move on. It doesn't, right? Because you can easily propagate to multiple tables, right? This. Um, I don't know if I should go back, but um, if you remember the other graph with uh, from Parta Talukdar, the graph of... Um, with set one and set two on the left and some is on the right, like Billy Joel, I think they were singers. Uh, there, the propagation happens kind of indiscriminately. It happens simultaneously to multiple nodes. If you are to contrast this with that one. Um, in that one, at one point, everything shifts and gets transferred in the graph. From, in, in the graph. Everything from the right sort of moves to the left. Everything. And from the left moves to the right. Well, the right, it moves everywhere because there is no left and right. It could be multiple outgoing edges at any point. Um, but here they are really careful about semantic if they want to avoid it. So they only pick one. Yes, of course, you explore everything around you, but then you pick one node. And you pick that one node, and then from that node, again, explore the out outgoing edges, and then you pick another one, and so on. So I just just shows you that we're not quite there, of course, at uh, solving this task. Uh, I'd say that we'll take a um, break and then we meet again in half an hour.